Hello and welcome to my office. This seminar is about strategy in pharma, medtech and other life sciences businesses. It's based on the 25 years that I have spent as an academic studying in the industry and before that the 20 years in the industry as a research scientist, marketer and strategist. So if you work in marketing, medical affairs, market access or strategy in pharma or medtech companies, this seminar is written for you. Please click subscribe and share it with your colleagues. And if you stick around to the end, then I'll tell you how to get copies of the published articles to support this seminar and my other seminars. Today's seminar is the third in a series of four. It is about st the strategy review process that most companies go through every year. It's an important process, of course, both for the company and also for your career. But often it's a waste of time and effort and it doesn't really achieve very much. Strategy review processes can be effective and useful, or they can be a pointless game playing exercise. In my research, I found that in the best companies, leaders ask four difficult questions and the strategists prepare four strong answers to make the strategy review process work well. The first of those questions, which we covered in the first seminar of this series, is what do we know about the market that our competitors don't know? If you missed that seminar, please take a look at it after this one is finished. The second of those questions followed on was, what's the difference between our strategy and that of our competitors? And I covered how to answer that question in the second seminar of the series. Again, if you missed it, take, please take a look after this seminar. So those first two questions focused on making sure that your strategy was strong. But as a famous academic once said, Donald Hambrick, he said that a strategy without an invitation is just a fantasy. And so the third question and the seminar focus on strategy implementation. If you've seen a lot of strategy reviews like I have, you'll have noticed something called the complacency window. The complacency window opens when the most important person in the room signals that they like the general direction of the strategy, and then they ask to move on to the detail of the execution. Now, at this point, the strategists who are presenting the plan tend to relax thinking that the job is all downhill from here. But that's a mistake. They've forgotten the truism that business is 5% strategy and 95% execution. At this point, the best leaders ask what seems to be a simple question, but which in fact is very, very important. They ask, how does it all fit together? At which point, a complacency window slams shut and the strategists sit up and pay attention. Most band teams struggle to find a strong answer to this question, simply because they've not thought about it enough. Only a minority of brand teams anticipate this question and give a strong answer. So let's talk about how they do that. I've watched many teams do this over the years, and when they give a strong answer, it's based on four important differences between strong and weak strategy execution. And in the rest of the seminar, I'm going to talk about those differences and how you can make sure that your strategy fits together like pieces of a well-made jigsaw. Strategy is like a conjoined twin of two vital decisions. Who will we offer value to? What kind of value will we offer them? The more clearly those decisions are made, the better the strategy. But there's a strange thing that I've seen happen in many, perhaps most, pharma and medtech companies. Those two strategy decisions are made, they're agreed, they're documented, and then they're put on a shelf and forgotten about. Then the strategic planning process moves on to agreeing operational activities, almost as if those strategic decisions had never been made. Now, this might sound unbelievable to you, but I promise you it's very, very common. There are both structural and cultural reasons why this behavior happens, which I've covered in other parts of my work. But in this seminar, I'm not going to talk about the causes because I want to focus on the problems caused by this behavior and how you can avoid them when you implement your strategy. When firms forget their strategy and move on to tactics, it creates inconsistency between the strategic decisions and the tactical actions. For example, the marketing team create messages for the whole market, not for the target segment. The medical fair team focuses on what they think is important rather than the wider value proposition. The market access team make and support the value claims that they have evidence for rather than the sort of value claims that peers care about. 
And the sales team might go on to develop territory and account plans that directs their activity to where it can be measured, which is not necessarily where the strategy calls for it to go. And so on, with hundreds of functional decisions creating a jumbled pile of commercial activity. And like an unmade jigsaw, each individual piece of this pile looks great, but it isn't the picture that was agreed on in the strategic plan. As I say, I've seen this happen in hundreds of pharma and medtech companies. Only a minority of teams make their tactical execution consistent with the strategy. How do they do this? Well, with one simple trick. They spell out those two strategic choices. Who will we offer value to? What kind of value will we offer them? And they spell that out in plain language and they tell everyone what those choices are in the clearest way possible. What they don't do is bury those two choices in a huge slide deck and make people infer their own view of what the strategy is. They make sure that everybody responsible for execution knows exactly what those strategic choices are and what they are. If this sounds simplistic to you, then take a look at your own strategic plan and your own team of implementers. Are those two choices really clear? Can you point to the page in the document where they are clearly written down? Could every implementer tell you where they are? Quite often, no. And if not, you have work to do because consistency with the strategy is the first step in answering that question about how does it all fit together. After consistency with your strategy, your next issue is complementarity, which is the way that the different activities improve each other. In pharma and medtech, even the simplest of strategic plans involve many separate activities each of which is developed and executed by those with specialist expertise in medicine, marketing, health economics, sales, and other expert know-how and expertise. In most companies, we use brand teams and matrix structures to coordinate this web of activity. But the detailed design and execution of these activities happens inside those functional silos. This isn't a book in the system, it's a feature. We have to do that way because it takes specialist expertise to make, for example, a medical education program or a market access dossier or an effective omnichannel campaign. Pharma and medtech companies are, and must be, collections of geeks who are very knowledgeable in their own area. But the geeks have a problem. In practice, these activities often don't complement each other, or worse, they contradict each other. For example, modern communications may push a message of trust and reliability uh, medical messaging might emphasize the contrary message of innovativeness. Market access teams might use value comparators that appeal to HTAs, but field teams have to deal with local formulas and pairs who might make different value comparisons. This lack of complementarity between functional activities leads to a lack of synergy, which makes execution less effective. But worse than that, in the eyes of the market, it can be contradictory and confusing. And like any customers in any market, prescribers, payers, and patients who are confused, won't spend time making sense of what they see, they will simply turn their attention elsewhere. Achieving complementarity between disparate functional activities is difficult, and only a minority of pharma and medtech teams are good at this. When I study them, I see three things that they do differently. First, they have strong and fully engaged leadership teams who don't let every function go off and do their own thing. Secondly, they have T-shaped skills, as they're called, meaning each specialist also has a good understanding of how other specialisms work. And third, they have a generally cooperative culture of idea sharing across the functional silos. Now, you may think that your team has those three traits, but I encourage you to be a little bit self-critical and ask yourself how well your team would score on those three things. And where you find weaknesses, well, that's where you have work to do if you want to answer the question, how does it all fit together? Much of the theory about strategy comes from research in consumer markets. But when it comes to strategy execution, there's a huge difference between consumer markets and pharma and medtech markets. Consumer choices are usually made by individuals with relatively little thought and often they're emotionally driven decisions. By contrast, the choice to prescribe or use a medicine or uh, to use a medical technology is almost always involves multiple stakeholders and is typically a thoughtful, rational decision that considers a wealth of clinical, economic and other factors. 
This means that the strategy execution has to address a multi-stage decision-making process, one that involves peers, healthcare professionals, patients and other stakeholders. This is important because each stage is influenced by different kinds of messages, using information from different sources and communicated through different channels. This multi-stage complexity makes it easy for strategy execution to miss something out, of a missing link in the chain as it were. For example, a disease awareness campaign can generate interest that dissipates when there's no substantive material to satisfy the interest. A value-based proposition can engage peers who then disengage when budget impact or comparative economic value is not addressed. In other words, strategic execution is a chain of activity and it's only as strong as its weakest or missing link. It's notoriously easy to think that your execution activity is complete when it isn't. It's notoriously difficult to make sure that your execution activity is complete and that no links are missing. And it becomes more difficult as more stakeholders are involved and the decision making process becomes more convoluted. Again, I've only seen a minority of pharma medic companies who are excellent at this. What do they do differently? Well, two things. First, they map out a decision journey in meticulous detail, and then they assiduously align execution activity to every part of that journey. Now, you might think your firm has got this right, but ask yourself where the decision journey map is. Does everybody have a copy? And does your activity align follow that map? If your answer to any of these questions is no or maybe, then you're, you're not yet able to answer the question, how does it all fit together? Let's imagine that you have a strategic execution plan that is consistent with the two strategic decisions that I discussed earlier. And let's imagine that those activities are wonderfully complemented to each other. And let's imagine that those activities cover the entire spectrum of the decision making process and all various stakeholders. In my research, it's unusual to find strategic plans that are like that, and it surprises me when I find them. But what surprises me even more is that some of these excellent plans still fail despite their strength. Why is that? Well, if you've any experience of corporate life, the answer shouldn't surprise you. Any kind of execution requires resources and assets. These include money, time, people, knowledge. And all of these resources and assets are in limited supply and any of which, if not provided in sufficient quality or of the right quality, can cause your strategic execution to fail. In other words, strong strategies with good execution plans can still fail if they aren't properly costed and resourced. I found it really interesting to study the differences between those pharma and medtech companies that resource the strategies well and those don't. I see that the best companies do th three things differently. First, the best teams fully understand the quantity and quality of the resources needed. Second, they're able to construct and communicate a compelling case for the allocation of those resources. And third, the leaders who review that case have the capabilities to assess the case effectively and allocate resources appropriately. Yeah, it's rare for pharma medtech companies to do all three of those things well. So strategy execution is often under-resourced and underpowered. And when that's the case, you'll have difficulty convincing your strategy reviewers that it all fits together. Just like the questions asked in the first two seminars of the series, it's important to ask the third question of, do the parts of the brand strategy fit together? And it's just as important to answer that question well. You might think it's an obvious and simplistic question, but it's not asked often enough, and it is even less common for it to be answered well. If this question is asked by the strategy reviewers and if the strategists have prepared strong answers, it leads to a much stronger strategy that has a much better chance of being executed effectively. And that's because execution depends on your activity being consistent with those two strategic choices, the choices being complemented to each other and complete across the decision making process and appropriately costed and resourced, those four topics. In strategy, as in other areas, better questions lead to better answers. Thanks for joining the seminar. If you found it worth your time, then please like, subscribe, share with your colleagues. If you'd like to read the articles that support the seminar, then mail me and I'll send them to you. If you'd like to browse the 400 articles, papers and books I've written about strategy in our industry, then please take a look at my website. Or if you'd just like to chat about how my research can help you improve your competitive capabilities, then I'd be happy to set up a virtual 
cup of tea with you anytime.